In ancient times, herds of powerful animals roamed the open spaces of the Arctic. They were undaunted by the cold, successfully surviving the harsh conditions of the Ice Age. Nonetheless, some 3,000 years ago, nature dictated that they disappear completely from Eurasia. Who can say how long the icy plains would have remained empty had human beings not undertaken a bold experiment? People intervened in the laws of nature and introduced 30 musk oxen to the Taimir Peninsula, animals that had been brought from Canada and Alaska. No one could have known back then for sure that the new settlers were actually capable of adapting to the conditions of the Taimir, thus restoring life that had long ago disappeared from the frozen territories of Eurasia. How did the experiment turn out? In order to be able to answer that question, we accepted the challenge it posed and made our way to the land of the snow drifts and winter gales to seek out the musk oxen there and to determine how they have fared in their new homeland. We are on the fourth day of our journey. The expedition has covered 300 kilometers after setting out from the village of Hatanga and has reached Lake Taimur. This lake, one of Siberia's largest, is situated in the center of the peninsula that bears the same name. We have to cross the lake in an easterly direction in order to reach the Bikata River, where the first musk oxen were released 30 years ago. No one has ever crossed the lake by motor vehicle before, which meant that we had no inkling of the difficulties that awaited us. At the end of winter, the ice covering the surface of the lake is more than two meters thick, which is enough to bear the weight of heavy trucks. Despite this, snowdrifts and fissures blocked our way and slowed our progress to a crawl. We had to leave the motors of the vehicles running all the time, even while we slept and ate. Otherwise, the motor oil would have frozen, and it would have been very difficult to get the truck started again. At the end of April, there are no more dark nights in the Taimir, and the polar day was about to begin, so we could travel at all times of day, depending on how the weather behaved. We didn't reach the field camp until the ninth day of our travels, having traversed 500 kilometers of unbelievably bad terrain.
The hut was in good condition, despite the fact that no one had been there for years. These walls and this roof are going to provide us with sanctuary for many long months in the cold kingdom of the tundra. We will be here on our own, and no one can come to our aid quickly. The Taimur is at the very northernmost tip of Eurasia. To a substantial extent, it is constituted of tundra, situated atop permafrost, devoid of human presence. Due to the constant winds, the wind chill temperature is even lower than the air temperature. Surviving under these conditions is very difficult. <laughs> Even in May, winter continues to rain in the Taimur. Everything is covered in glistening snow. We had to start looking for musk oxen in this white world, reminiscent at first glance of the desert. in the tundra for days without finding a single musk ox. On rare occasions, we would encounter rock petarmions and hares. In order to remain alive, one has to be undetectable. Therefore, the animals and birds became visible only when they started to move. On some clearings, we came across muskox droppings. They were apparently from this season, plainly in sight on top of the snow. These finds gave us hope. With each passing day, we ventured further into the tundra, making ever broader exploratory sweeps. Every time that we reached the top of a rise, we hoped to see musk oxen. Unfortunately, they were nowhere to be seen. Perhaps there are so few of them here that meeting one would be an enormous stroke of luck. The only location that we didn't make it to was the Buranga foothills. 
they were just too distant to reach on skis. This left us no option but to clear the garage of snow and to undertake the long journey on the ancient snowmobile that it had housed for a long time. As soon as we reached the foothills, we saw what we had been looking for for so long. Дай-ка я посмотрю. Сплошная белизна и отдельные камни. У Валера, а камни-то движутся. The herd was foraging on a sloping hillside, and it would be impossible to approach it from across the clearing. Начинай подходить, только остерегайся самца. Если бы кинется на тебя, прыгай вниз с террасы. Валера, подходи ближе. Подходи ближе. When we had moved ahead a couple of hundred meters, the oxen noticed us and gathered together. Just a few more steps, and the herd made a run for it, spreading quickly into the tundra. This situation repeated itself again and again whenever we came across a new herd of animals. Still, we managed to make one smaller herd assume a defensive formation in the shape of a circle. The animals stand in a tight arc, with their little ones situated inside the perimeter. Even wolves, the only enemies that musk oxen have in these parts, are incapable of penetrating these defenses. This is the calving period. Ordinarily, musk oxen give birth once every two years when they bear a single calf or, on rare occasions, two. The little ones arrive in April at a time when the Taimir is still in the grip of bitter cold. The best defense that musk oxen have against the cold and wind is their fur. Their long, shaggy coats, reminiscent of a cape, hang all the way to the ground, reaching a length of 90 centimeters. Beneath the long, coarse layer of outer hair, there is a layer of finer under hair, which is called the kiviut. This is what protects the animals from going into hypothermia during the winter.
now, the calendar summer has arrived in the Taimur. It is the month of June. Today is the first day when the temperature has reached zero degrees. The snow near our house has begun to melt and we hurry to shovel it away. flatlands, the spring thaw proceeds at a furious pace. The level of water in the river rises every day as though someone had thrown yeast in the water, advancing ever closer to our quarters. We were only off by a day in our calculations. Nature has her own schedule, and because of this, the movement of the ice took us by surprise. The snowmelt runoff period had begun. The considerable spring flooding in the tundra interfered with our ability to move. We were hemmed in by water and ice that imprisoned us, cutting us off from the surrounding world. All we could do was to observe the immediate area around the field camp and to get better acquainted with our new neighbors. On the previous day, 
There had been neither hide nor hair of the musk oxen, and now, all of a sudden, they appeared right by our house. They were unperturbed by the field camp buildings, the wire fencing that lay on the ground, and the empty fuel tanks. Instead of taking their time to graze, all of the animals hurried in one direction, downstream along the river. It was obvious that there was a purpose to their movement. As it turned out, the musk oxen were seeking what they had been deprived of all through the long winter, that being salt. Instead of drinking water during the long winter, they had been eating snow which had weakened their organisms. At the estuary of the Bicada, there are natural salt deposits. The animals are aware of their existence and consequently they are drawn there and in a particularly powerful fashion in the spring. Having satisfied their craving for salt, the musk oxen leave the salt deposits and settle down in the vicinity for a rest. Grown animals will ordinarily rest for more than an hour. During this time they are not very alert, and we are able to creep quite close to the resting herd on some occasions. The restlessness of the youngsters doesn't enable them to stay put for as long as their elders do. They have already built up their strength and try to check out the surrounding world of their own volition. A year will pass before the young animals gain their independence. For the first half year of their lives, their mothers nurse them, but they do eat other food as well. Sexual maturity doesn't arrive until the animals are four years of age. These animals have quite a bit of growing to do first. With luck, musk oxen can live for as long as 20 years. The flooding is over now, and it becomes safe to travel on the river. We wish to explore the headwaters of the Bicada and to look for musk oxen there. The source of the Bicada is high up in the mountains and is quite difficult to access. The mountains have been hard to reach up until now and have not been explored to any significant extent which means that our journey will prove to be difficult. Moving upstream along the river, we encountered small herds of musk oxen grazing on its banks. 
musk oxen are not particular about what they eat and adapt easily to various combinations of plant growth. They dine on the leaves of dwarf willow trees as well as various grasses and mosses with equal relish. Despite their dimensions, the nature of musk oxen is more reminiscent of sheep than of cattle. This is a rather large animal. Male specimens reach as much as 145 centimeters in height and weigh as much as 250 kilograms. The females are about a quarter smaller than the males. During our trek of several days, moving along the river, the tundra changed before our eyes, assuming a multicolored hue. Innumerable blossoms appeared on the banks of the river, which heralded the coming of a new season. The long-awaited summer had finally arrived in the northern region. The beginning of the warm season marks the time when the musk oxen shed their fur. They seek places where they can rub off the old fleece. Steep hillsides are suitable for this. The youngsters imitate their elders and develop awareness of their bodies through this enjoyable activity. For the musk oxen, wrapped in their warm coats, the summer, with its heat, is a trying time. When the heat becomes unbearable, they take a dip in the water or gather near patches of snow where they lounge for several hours. Fortunately, the hot days in the Taimir don't last long. Everything can change in the blink of an eye. Extremes are ordinary here.
Moving upstream along the river, we reached the foothills of the Biranga Range. The river became shallower, and ever more frequently, we were forced to portage. As we explored the mountains, we soon became convinced that these locations are excellent habitats for the musk oxen. Succulent grass is in sufficient supply, and there are fewer swampy areas. It seemed as though the musk oxen prefer the mountains to level areas, since we encountered them even near glaciers in the most inhospitable and isolated parts of the Biranga. On our way back, we began to encounter herds of reindeer with increasing frequency. Soon, one of the most magnificent displays of the Taimir wilderness is about to take place. The reindeer appeared suddenly. The animals moved in the tundra in a manner reminiscent of swarms of wild bees. They approached us with no fear, much like a living river that flowed through us and moved ahead in a peaceful manner. It was just incredible. We had never seen anything like this in our lives. Experts believe that a short-lived gathering of animals of this kind is a regular annual event, something that has developed during the evolutionary process. It is during this time that the animals inform one another of the condition and status of the population through a complex set of signs. According to the estimates of some scientists, as many as a million reindeer move through the Taimir in their search for something to eat. That makes them the largest population of reindeer in the world. In contrast to the nomadic reindeer, musk oxen are stationary animals with a placid disposition. They don't undertake long travels, preferring to stay within the bounds of a given territory, traversing short distances. Unlike the reindeer, musk oxen don't form large herds. Summer herds are made up of 10 to 20 animals of various ages and both genders. Musk oxen have their own ways. When danger threatens, they don't run away, but form a defensive circle. This type of a defense strategy works well against wolves and cinematographers. It is fatally flawed, however, when one is confronted by armed humans and almost led to the extinction of the musk oxen.
By the beginning of the 20th century, musk oxen could only be found in Greenland and on the northern Canadian islands. In Eurasia, they had died out totally, apparently as a result of climate change, along with other fauna from the age of the mammoths. In order to reintroduce musk oxen back to the locations they had once historically inhabited, scientists decided to undertake an experiment. In 1974, the first musk oxen were captured and settled in the Taimir. No one knew at the time how the newcomers would behave. During the first years, several animals perished. Several more managed to break out of enclosures, but the main body of the herd survived, and by the fourth year, they were reproducing. 10 years later, when the size of the herd consisted of 100 animals, they were released into the wild. During 35 years of independent life in the Taimir, the musk oxen have definitely succeeded in occupying an empty niche. With each passing year, their number grows, having reached a total number of four to 5,000 animals at the present. Now that it can be said that the experiment in the Taimir has been a success, scientists are trying to settle animals into other areas of the Russian far north as well. In September, the days in the Taimir are short. Because of this, the helicopter starts out on the expedition to trap musk oxen as early in the day as possible. One has to make it back to the camp by dusk. Against the white background of the tundra, the musk oxen are visible from far away. Dogs are released to keep the animals from escaping. As soon as the dogs catch up with the herd, it goes into a defensive huddle. The herd is surrounded. Now, Everything depends on the person with the tranquilizer gun. He has to pick out the youngsters born this year, nestled amidst the dense wall of animals. The young animals handle stress better than grown oxen, and they are also easier to transport. The tranquilizer starts to exert its influence once a few minutes have gone by, and the calf settles onto the ground. Now it is important to disperse the herd quickly and to administer a counteragent, for otherwise the youngster may perish.
it takes the scientists two days to catch 20 calves. Now that all the animals are in the transport container, no time can be lost. Otherwise, the stress they have to endure, along with the cramped quarters, may prove fatal to them. A flight to their new place of residence in Yakutia awaits them, to the truly cold lands. Yakutia is considered to be the coldest place not only in Russia, but in all of the Northern Hemisphere. This is where the climatic cold pole is situated, where the temperature can fall to 70 degrees below zero centigrade. There is only one place in the world that is even colder than this, Antarctica. Severe cold can last as long as a month here. Ordinarily, the median temperature in Yakutia during the winter is minus 40 degrees, which the local residents and animals have grown accustomed to. For the musk oxen, cold is not a problem. That is why Yakutia became the first region in Russia a decade ago where musk oxen from the Taimir were settled. Farms have been set up in Yakutia for the domestication of musk oxen. The Living Diamonds of Yakutia farm operates in the taiga village of Taz Yuryak. Here, 12 musk oxen are being tended to. They have adapted well to their new living conditions and have produced the first generation of offspring. A calf born in this farm is completely tame. He accepts being stroked, will eat from people's hands, and displays no aggressiveness towards humans. The grown animals, on the other hand, don't tolerate such behavior. Because of his combativeness, the tips of the horns of the dominant bull have been trimmed. Otherwise, the lives of the farm workers would be in constant jeopardy. The second half of August has rolled around. Fall has arrived in the Taimir. This is the time of year when the musk oxen are at their most excitable. The law of evolution is spurring them to reproduce. 
The females, in heat, are ready to mate, which puts the dominant male in a ferocious mood. He is like a shepherd who is on guard, corralling the cows to keep them from running off. He drives off young bulls. When the males are rutting and the females are in heat, the herd remains essentially stationary, in one place. If the animals were to move, there is the danger that the females might disperse and the herd would encounter wandering males. Should such an encounter take place nonetheless, a battle between the males is inevitable. All butting of heads is aimed at the base of the horns and the forepart of the skull. These are the most violent of all collisions of heads in the animal kingdom. The upper section of the horns, called the horn boss, is like a shield that can be as thick as 10 centimeters. This is what keeps the musk oxen from getting concussions. Сегодня дождь идет, погода скверная, съемок никаких нет. Сидим в избе, слушаем музыку. Вылетать когда будем? Ну сейчас посмотрю. Now the season has come when the tundra falls totally into the grip of winter. Tired of solitude and desolation, we decided to take leave of the tundra. While observing the musk oxen, we became convinced that the experiment carried out by human beings, intervening thereby in natural processes, has gone successfully up until now, and that musk oxen live once again on the wide open snowy spaces of the Taimir. In the not too distant future, it should be possible to once again encounter the ancient animal king of this area, the musk ox, throughout all of northern Eurasia. Hopefully this will happen fairly soon, and in the future, people will not have to worry about the continued existence of these superb animals. There are approximately 45,000 musk oxen in the world at the present, 5,000 of them in Russia. <laughs> 